Hello everyone, my name is Chi Chen. You can call me CC. First, I want to introduce myself. Uh, I am a critical care physician. I just graduated from my critical care fellowship in the United States. And while waiting the time for me to start my uh, first job as an ICU attending, I want to use this time to make a series of ICU videos talking about ICU advanced physiologies. I would like to start with shock. And uh, the first important uh, thing that we need to understand is organ perfusions. Uh, the shock, by definition, is inadequate perfusion and oxygenation of cells, eventually lead to organ dysfunction and damage. As you can see here, from the hemodynamic perspective, it's inadequate perfusions. It's not about inadequate blood pressure or inadequate uh, arterial resistance. It's really about inadequate perfusion uh, that uh, will uh, lead to uh, the cellular dysfunctions and then organ damage. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Mike Pinsky. He is a talented physician from UPMC. Uh, he has been teaching the hemodynamic monitoring for more than 20 years, and I do learn from him a lot through the uh, ATS education videos. You can assess his videos from the website that I provided. What I will say is that if you have time to watch his video, you can watch his videos without watching mine. But if you uh, like the way I talk about things, you can watch my videos. But later, if you have time, please watch his video first. His, uh, his talk about advanced physiologies are really comprehensive and it will open your mind. Okay, so I want to start to ask you about a question, uh, two questions. Um, how can episodic blood ejection from the heart achieve a steady blood flow? And how can this small amount of uh, positile blood flow, which is stroke volume, probably only around 75 cc, maintain a distal blood flow? It's kind of an interesting question, right? Uh, by answering those questions, um, I want to draw your attention to the, uh, the distribution of arterial tree. So if uh, there is a stroke volume coming out from the heart, to, we'll go to the aorta first, and we'll go to elex the artery, and to the muscular artery, and eventually, before going to the capillary, it will reach arteriolus. And understand those uh, terms are not about, I mean, those from the possible to distal side, it's not only about the change of calibers, it's also about the differences in the histology. As you can see here, elex the artery have a high content of elastin, but relative low content of smooth muscles. At the same time, in the muscular artery, you have relative low elastin, and you have a high content of smooth muscles. When the blood reaches the arteriolus, the arteriolus only have a, a smooth muscle without any content of elastin. So you can see, just because the change, uh, the differences in the histology, you have a different compliance and resistance of arteries. In the elastic artery, you definitely will have more high capacitance and high compliance, more flexible arteries. Uh, compared to arteriolus, you do have more uh, artery with a high resistance, and, um, uh, and, and, and it's really a stiff vessel. So resistance is not equal along the arterial tree. And uh, what you can see here is from the proximal aorta to the distal arteriolus, you can see there is a perfusion, uh, sorry, pulse pressure change. And you can see there is barely a, a change in pulse pressure from the aorta to the elexi artery. But there is a huge drop in the pulse pressure in the arteriolus. That means that the highest resistance in the uh, arterial tree is located at arteriolus. So if you simplify these models, it's you have a large capacitors in the proximal side, uh, like formed by the aorta in elastic arteries. It's really like really flexible and act like a blood reservoir. And what the stroke will do is to fill the capacitor, make sure it doesn't empty out. And what really controls the blood flow peripherally to the organs is from the peripheral arteries with a high resistance. And then by adjusting the resistance, by adjusting the vascular caliber, you can uh, have a regulation of organ blood flow at real time. So uh, then um, that people that brought out the idea about Wink-Kessel model. Wink-Kessel model is try to relate the um, 
the the uh, how the organ perfusions uh, from using an example of a firefighter drawing the water from a canal to the pump and then to a water reservoir which is wind castles and how the firefighter using the fire using the water and you know you know how strong the water should be is basing on the uh, the distal side that regulating the resistance regulating the pressure regulating the the calibers and then by doing that that can change the water flow at real time and uh, in the um, in our arterial tree, it act like the same. So elastic artery is a huge capacitor, act like a reservoir, and the stroke volume is just to fill those capacitors. Uh, and arteriolus and the precapillary sphincter act like a switch, uh, basically adjusting and adjusting the resistance and then controlled organ perfusions. Now we kind of understand this uh, this distribution of arterial tree, how the differences in histology lead to the organ perfusions. The next question is, what control the distribution uh, of organ blood flow locally? So uh, there are different factors that control the blood flow, and I want to bring out the two most important factors. One is local metabolic factors like the lactate and like adenosine. And those are the things that primarily uh, the regulating the local um, local organ blood flow, but at extreme conditions, uh, your adrenergic system playing a dominant role in adjusting um, uh, in adjusting and regulating organ blood flow. So let me talk you with you about the important concept of autoregulations. So every vessels uh, to the organs have a certain capacity of autoregulations, uh, except skin. Skin really have no autoregulation at all, but we'll talk about that later. And let's say you have a vessels have a certain resistance, certain flow, and certain pressure. And today, there is some condition that dropped the systolic blood pressure from 100 to 70. And you can see as a drop of the pressure, and without autoregulation, you will have a drop of the flow. If there is no change of resistance, then you are not able to compensate the flow, and uh, eventually uh, your flow become pressure dependent. But with uh, the capa with the capability of autoregulation, if you have a drop in your pressure, you will have a concurrent change in your arterial resistance. By changing the arterial resistance, you have a vessel dietary, dietary effect, then you can compensate in the blood flow. And then so I want to bring out this most important graph, and I will bring this graph in the following lectures. It's basically the relationship between the blood flow and the perfusion pressures. As you can see in the yellow zone, which is extreme conditions, where you have low or high perfusion pressures. In those uh, areas, you essentially lost the capability of autoregulation, and your blood flow become perfusion pressure dependent. But during the rest condition, like normal human being without any pathophysiology uh, status, you have a constant blood flow, and this constant blood flow to the organ is regulated by the constant change of your uh, resistance and your pressure. And so that can you can um, maintain a steady blood flow to organs. Uh, what you can see here at the junction between the yellow and red is the side of where you have maximal vessel dilatations. While your perfusion go to the yellow uh, further, then you have a drop of your you have totally lost your function of autoregulation, and then your perfusion pressure become sorry your blood flow become perfusion pressure dependent. So when cardiac output drops significantly, you do have a global perfusion pressure drops. With that, local autoregulation may not be able to maintain the perfusion to the vital organs. Eventually, you will have a phenomenon called a redistribution of organ blood flow. And this phenomenon is primarily regulated by the adrenergic systems. During the regular uh, resting normal without any pathology conditions, your cardiac output is probably around 5 liter per minute. And this 5 liter uh, going to um, different organs at different proportions. For example, you have 15% of cardiac output going to the brain. You have 20% of uh, cardiac output going to the kidney. And that is how it is. 
And you can imagine that uh, before blood going to the organs, you have arteriolus and you have capillaries and you have precapillary sphincters, and those act like a switch prior to going prior to going to the organs uh, to regulate the blood flow and to regulate this um, to make sure that there is a, a constant uh, blood flow to the different organs, and then that can supply the organs at different rates and different proportion. So it's kind of okay. I kind of mess up, but this is how it is. And so, <laughs> an interesting phenomenon is that those arteriolus and those uh, precapillary sphincters have a different proportion of alpha receptors. For example, you barely, you don't have any alpha receptors uh, of the arteries that supply in the brain, but you do have some mild, very small amount of uh, the alpha receptors before going to the heart. And the majority of alpha receptors in our body uh, is located at skeletal muscles and the skins. Uh, and you do have medial, medium amount of uh, alpha receptors in the arteriolus and the precapillary sphincters of, of gut, of liver, and the kidney. So today, let's say if you have drop of your cardiac output to 2 liter per minute, uh, essentially you are in a shock status. In that, you have a super activation of your adrenergic systems. And with that, because there is profound of uh, uh, alpha receptor in the skeletal muscles and skins, there will be a, a, a significant drop in, in the blood flow to those regions. And the reason for that is that since that you have a drop of your blood flow to skeletal muscles and skins, you can relative provide a more blood flow to the, to the brain and to the heart. And that is how it is. We know that very clearly, that seeing uh, the ICU patient every day, that almost you have a patient with shock, you will see skin modeling, right? You will see uh, some, kind, some extent of acute injury. Um, and then um, you have this redistribution of blood flow happens, and then that is to provide the blood flow to the, to the heart and to the brain. Uh, I always want to draw your attention is that not only the different organs have a different alpha receptors of the arterial trees, but also um, different organs have a different capability of oxygen delivery, oxygen consumption, and oxygen extraction ratio. So the brain and heart, although require a lot of oxygen, they have a relative low uh, oxygen extraction ratios. And when the global oxygenation drops, there is a blood redistribution to the organ with less extraction ratio, uh, like a brain and heart, and that is how it is. Okay, so um, let me summarize a little bit about what we talk. Um, so maintaining the MAP in critically ill patients is to preserve autoregulation. Uh, as you can see before, that the primarily the reason that we use vessel pressors is to increase the MAP to a point you have a perfusion pressure, and that perfusion pressure can uh, in the are in the red region where you have a steady blood flow and where your body can autoregulate the blood flow. The redistribution of organ blood flow happen during low cardiac output primarily through the adrenergic systems. Okay, the last part I want to talk about, um, there are different relationships of the organ blood flow to arterial pressure in different organs. This is a slide from directly from Dr. Michael Pinsky. Um, so Dr. Kramer in 1989 did a study try to figure out the organ blood flow to arterial pressure relationship. Uh, so he did a study in canning models uh, so what you can see here, at a set of arterial pressure, you do have a different organ blood flow. That's what we talked before, that you have a lot of blood flow going to the kidney. And that is how it is. Um, with drop of the blood pressure, uh, for example, then what happened is interesting that you have a relative a huge drop in your kidney blood flow. You have relative uh, medium drop of your gut flow. And you have a little drop in your liver, uh, a blood flow to the liver. This is again what we see in daily practice that in patients with shock, you always see that, you almost always see that there is acute kidney injury. But if you have a patient with a shock liver, that means this shock is fairly profound. And this is because 
uh, um, the kidney is really sensitive to the arterial pressure drops, and you have a drop of arterial pressure, you will have a relative huge drop in your organ blood flow. So the perfusion pressure of different organs therefore are different and should be individualized. Kidney tend to have low resistance, so they are bound to have ischemia. Compared to the liver, liver have a relative high resistance system, so there's uh, only slight increase of blood flow uh, will happen even you increase the perfusion pressure significantly. Okay, so those are the things that I want to talk about today. The key point for this talk we talk about is the circulation can be explained by the Wincastle models, where at the central part you have a uh, high capacitance, and what regulates the blood flow is in the peripheral artery with high resistance. And the reason of that is because the histology of the arterial trees are different. Maintain the map in critical ill patients is to preserve autoregulations. And the redistribution of organ blood flow happened during low cardiac output and primarily through the adrenergic systems. And because you have a different um, proportion of alpha receptors in different organs, so that redistribution of organ blood flow will naturally happen to uh, guide to leaning to those blood flow to the vital organs. Perfusion pressure are different organs are different and should be individualized. So the next talk will I will talk about the perfusion pressure, and uh, first I want to talk about how pressure difference that drive organ blood flow, and in this part I will talk about a phenomenon called vascular waterfall and what is critical closing pressure. Uh, in the patient with shock, it's important we think about the perfusion pressures and how can we maximize that by increasing the MAP and the dropping of tissue pressures. And the last part I will talk about uh, in more uh, associated with a clinical practice is how can we choose MAP in different patients? Uh, who needs MAP of 65 and who may benefit from higher MAP goal? And then who may just require MAP of 60 and that's fine for them.